going to download it uh, and then it should work. Let's see, it's downloading now. And let's open it up here. Uh, there are two things. The last slide, uh, yes. it says acknowledgements and it has your name on it and picture on it. So, and okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right. So I'll be, do you want me to go slide by slide? Yes, when you want, we are okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Justine, I'm just going to share my screen. I have a few announcements to the audience and Perfect. then uh, we start with you, okay? How many attendees right now? So right now we don't have a lot because we uh, waited too much to start. But uh, after the pandemic, what we know is that we have around 500 to 1,000 views on YouTube in the next uh, couple of weeks after the webinar. Unfortunately, on this one specifically, we don't have a lot of uh, live, but uh, we are usually have 100 live. We don't have this today, but uh, usually people watch on their uh, better time uh, on YouTube. Thank you. Okay, so hi, everybody. Welcome to Congenital Heart Academy. We are very happy to have all of you with us uh, here today in this very special uh, 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 webinar. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, uh, listen what Dr. Justino has to tell us today in this very difficult uh, uh, disease. Just remind all of you to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. There you, you are going to be able to review uh, this uh, um, a webinar and all the other more than 200 webinars we have done uh, so far. Just remind you guys, tomorrow we are going to have another meeting of our fetal cardiology series. We are going to talk about fetal uh, arrhythmias and pacemaker. And um, in the next couple of weeks, please send your research to this very special issue of the, the children. Dr. Uh, Sasha is one of the guest editors. It's going to be a very, very special issue. So we hope to see the research of all of, all of you uh, uh, there. And just uh, a reminder that uh, the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery, it's around the corner, only four months to go. We are all very excited. The program is amazing. The speakers are great. Uh, we, are, we are planning a lot of nice things for you guys. Uh, the abstract submission is open. So please uh, submit your research, show the world what you have been doing. And uh, we are going to be very happy to have all of you uh, with us uh, now. Now I'd like to let Dr. Varun introduce, oh, let me just get out of this. I introduce Dr. Uh, uh, Andy Justino here. It's very nice to have uh, uh, you here with us today. Uh, by training, I'm an interventional cardiologist as well. So I remember one meeting, one pics that you were talking about uh, a venous recannulation. And then you said, my fellow did wrong. He got a big cup of coffee in the morning and we stayed in the case around <laughs> 10 hours. <laughs> so he was not happy on that. It was something that I, I always remember when I think uh, when I'm going to start something, mm, maybe better think about what I'm going to have before. <laughs> so Varun, if you can please uh, introduce Dr. Justino and let's start this amazing meeting. Thank you guys for joining us and please type your questions on the Q&A chat box. Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Congenital Heart Academy and CHIP Network, uh, we thank Dr. Justino for taking time to talk to us and learn uh, from his experience. He's probably the most skilled interventional cardiologist uh, that we know in the world, and uh, he has amazing skills and amazing 3D understanding of the heart anatomy. So, we are looking forward to learn. He is currently a professor at UC San Diego uh, in uh, uh, in San Diego, California, and uh, yeah, more, he has many more accomplishments. And we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Dr. Jesse. Thank you so much, Varun and, and Grace. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, be at this meeting. Um, it's a uh, well, we're going to be talking about pulmonary vein atresia today, and uh, this work actually was largely composed uh, with uh, the help of Varun, who was the first author on the paper and was instrumental to uh, putting the research together. Um, the work was um, done while I was at Texas Children's Hospital, 
and uh, I'm now uh, at UCSD, UC San Diego, uh, and uh, Rady Children's Hospital. But I will uh, share my slides. These are slides uh, from the work that was performed at Texas Children's Hospital. And what I would like to do, um, I'll share here my screen. Let me know if this is uh, working correctly. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So um, we'll be talking about pulmonary vein atresia. We'll talk about the transcatheter interventions that we can offer for this lesion and discuss uh, some of the outcomes of these interventions. And again, I want to acknowledge especially uh, Varun Agarwal uh, as the lead author on this uh, work, as well as Lindsay Ehlers and uh, Gary Stapleton, uh, my colleagues at Texas Children's Hospital at the time. Um, so Pulmonary vein atresia is, um, is a problem that has, uh, in general, not been met with very good solutions. Um, there are case reports in the literature of patients uh, essentially having pneumonectomies uh, for uh, lungs that develop uh, pulmonary hemorrhage uh, because we don't have very good solutions for pulmonary vein atresia. And uh, certainly, hemoptysis is one of the leading complications that can occur in these patients but a host of other complications can occur as well. Uh, so as you can see, a high mortality rate from patients who develop uh, pulmonary vein atresia, particularly when uh, it involves uh, bilateral uh, disease, uh, in, in other words, disease in both lungs and in multiple lobes. So our uh, objective with this uh, study was to look at our success rate at treating uh, pulmonary vein atresia in the cardiac cath lab, uh, using some newer recanalization techniques uh, for the pulmonary veins, and then what are the long-term outcomes of these veins that we treat that start off with atresia? Do they have any long-term chance of staying open or not? So we want to measure the success, not just from an acute perspective, but also want to think about what does this actually bring for the patient? What is the long-term outcome of these veins? So this was a single center study that we performed at Texas Children's Hospital and included patients all the way back from January 1995 all the way till May 2019. Uh, it was a retrospective review. Um, and during this time, because it was a long time span, uh, we uh, clearly advanced in transcatheter techniques, and we were able to then compare even an era effect on how uh, these uh, patients did with the differing techniques that were being offered to them. Uh, we had IRB approval to perform this retrospective study. So we found 54 patients in our database that had been uh, given the diagnosis of pulmonary vein atresia and who underwent cardiac catheterization. So patients who had pulmonary vein atresia but were only diagnosed with a CT scan, for example, and never came to the cath lab, those were not included in our review. Um, of the patients who came to the cath lab, uh, about half came only for a diagnostic catheterization, and uh, the other half, a little more than half, received interventions. And as you will see, uh, the shift uh, went from an early uh, time span of mostly diagnoses and later interventions. So what is the age uh, of patients who present uh, with pulmonary vein atresia? The vast majority are very young. As you can see, the median age is 1.5 years. So we believe this is a disease that develops most likely in infancy and may present late, but is unlikely to develop late and likely develops in infancy. Um, it's a roughly half-half male to female uh, distribution, a little bit more, 57% uh, in males, but not a strong predilection either way. Um, so, the diagnosis, uh, what uh, uh, other diagnoses exist in patients who have pulmonary vein atresia? Well, from a cardiac standpoint, uh, 34 of our patients had uh, associated congenital heart disease. So this is total anomalous pulmonary venous return or partial anomalous pulmonary venous return that had undergone previous surgical repair. That was a total of six patients. Uh, scimitar syndrome that had been repaired a total of two patients. Isolated pulmonary vein atresia, there were 10 patients uh, with no other forms of congenital heart disease. Prematurity and chronic lung disease uh, coexisted in six patients. Adams-Oliver syndrome, which can be associated with pulmonary vein stenosis, was present in one patient. 
Gorlin syndrome in one, fibrosing mediastinitis in one patient. So again, this is a very different entity uh, that can develop later, and it is a form of acquired pulmonary vein stenosis or atresia, and we had one patient with this entity. And we had one patient that had pulmonary vein atresia as a consequence of a prior atrial fibrillation ablation. Um, the problem of atrial fibrillation ablation is a much bigger problem in the adult population, and uh, certainly at a, at, during the era when uh, radiofrequency was commonly used for ablation. Uh, nowadays, with the use of cryo energy for ablation, that uh, incidence has dropped dramatically, and certainly it was never a, a, a big contributor, contributor to the pediatric burden of disease uh, because atrial fibrillation is so uncommon uh, in children. So what percent of children have two ventricle circulations versus one uh, ventricle circulation? Uh, about two thirds, about 72% of our, of our series had biventricular physiology and a little over a quarter had single ventricle physiology. And we believe that the pulmonary vein was uh, a developed acquired atresia in about half, just under half, and the other half was congenital. In other words, these were veins that were not touched surgically and just spontaneously developed atresia. Um, so what are the characteristics of these atretic uh, pulmonary veins? Well, the length of the atresia can be very variable. Some people can have a rather short focal area of atresia and others can have a very long segment of atresia as measured angiographically in the cath lab. We see that the uh, median uh, length of the atretic segment was about uh, 8.7 millimeters. So this is a fair amount of length and um, uh, this, is, this lends itself to the techniques that we will discuss about how do we recanalize long segment uh, veins like this. Uh, the median uh, distal pulmonary vein diameter was 2.3 millimeters, okay, with an interquartile range of 1.5 to 3.25. Why does this matter? When pulmonary veins become atretic, the flow through the affected lobe becomes greatly diminished. And we believe that the pulmonary veins upstream of of the atresia initially can be actually dilated, engorged by the elevated pulmonary venous pressure. But over time, through uh, lack of flow through that lobe, those veins actually begin to involute and become smaller. And uh, the diameter of 2.3 millimeters being the median diameter beyond the area of occlusion in the normal part of the vein, as best that we could tell, it, it tells us how hypoplastic those pulmonary veins were. Um, so the year at the initial catheterization uh, changed dramatically over time. As you can see, before 2005, we had six patients that underwent a catheterization, seven between 20, 2005 and 2010, 12 patients between 2010 and 2015, and then after 2015, we had 29 patients. What does this mean? How do we interpret this? Uh, one inter possible interpretation is that the uh, incidence uh, or the prevalence of the disease is increasing dramatically uh, over time and is a, is a disease that is more common nowadays. It's possible that that's not the right answer, though. It's possible that this reflects simply a referral bias that has changed in the past patients would either be known to have pulmonary vein atresia based on uh, echocardiogram or CT scan, and just there was no hope that was offered to them, so they would just never come to the cath lab. And we would therefore not have included those in our series because we only included those that underwent catheterization. Whereas after 2015, as uh, we really embarked earnestly on a, on a very vigorous program to reestablish patency of all patients with pulmonary vein stenosis, um, we found that we had a, a greater number of patients coming to the cath lab, perhaps because we were offering a, a, an honest therapy that could help them. Now, what about the recanalization success rate? So with pulmonary vein atresia, we need to uh, recanalize the atretic pulmonary vein and uh, we need to then uh, balloon angioplasty it or stent it. So the first step is we have to get across the lesion. And as you can see, before 2005, all six patients that underwent catheterization had no attempt at recanalization in blue. Um, this was merely a diagnostic catheterization. 
Uh, between 25 and 2010, we started to have one successful recanalization attempt and one unsuccessful attempt, but the majority still were undergoing diagnostic catheterizations. Between 2010 and 2015, an increased interest in coming to the cath lab, but when we found atresia, most were not even attempted uh, to have a recanalization attempt. And a few had attempts, but were not successful. After 2015, a dramatic increase in the recanalization success rate, where we now have 19 patients that, um, that had a successful recanalization, uh, and only five that we didn't even try for various reasons. So the recanalization success rate overall, we had 20 out of the 29 patients that underwent a, a, a recanalization attempt. We had a total of almost 70% were successful. And we believe that if we had looked at uh, only a later era, that success would have even been higher, but we included all recanalization attempts. Unsuccessful attempts were about 30%. Now, how did we recanalize these veins? Well, we used uh, in the majority of patients a chronic total occlusion wire, CTO wire. These are wires that you are already familiar with. They're clearly not designed for pulmonary vein atresia recanalization. They're designed for coronary artery recanalization or peripheral arterial recanalizations. So we learn about these wires through our adult interventional cardiology colleagues and even adult interventional radiology or vascular surgery. So using a variety of these wires, typically 0.014 inch wires, although sometimes 0.018 inch wires could be used as well. And that is sufficient to cross the lesion in about three quarters of the cases. Now, uh, radio frequency assisted perforation. This is where we use a radio frequency wire to burn across the lesion. And the majority of those patients use the Bayless uh, system of radio frequency energy using the Nikonin wire. Uh, that was about 14% uh, of cases. And those that had a combination of both, uh, an initial attempt with CTO wire, but then uh, conversion to a um, uh, RF wire, um, was about 10% of cases. Um, then um, all recanalizations that were done in this series uh, were, except for one, was starting in the left atrium and advancing the wire across the vein out toward the lung. There was only one patient that had uh, a recanalization from the lung toward the left atrium, and that was uh, done through uh, an intrapulmonary collateral vein and one other patient that we uh, did as a, a novel approach of a transthoracic approach to the uh, pulmonary vein atresia using a needle directly into the chest, into the uh, open portion of the pulmonary vein, and then a wire to cross the lesion toward the left atrium. So these are examples of atresia of a pulmonary, left lower pulmonary vein, and you can see the wire pushing through the atresia. This is not even uh, exactly a CTO type wire. This is a wire that can be uh, considered a, a workhorse type wire that gets through the lesion. And uh, this is because it's a relatively recent occlusion. It was truly occluded, but the, the material is still soft that is resulting in the occlusion and we can get through uh, the lesion with a regular wire. Um, here's an example again of that same vein that was a tretic in the left lower and then was patent after placement of stents. As you can see, this patient had five pulmonary vein stents placed in one cath. Um, in this case, three of the five veins were a tretic in a very sick baby with severe multivessel pulmonary vein stenosis and was in cardiogenic shock and immediately after placement of five stents had a dramatic improvement. Uh, this is a technique uh, that uh, you should be already familiar with, but if you're not, it, it is helpful to show it uh, uh, in this movie where we use a guide catheter, which is in dark blue, and a, a Judkins right catheter inside the guide catheter. So we can use a five or six French guide catheter. Typically, these are five, uh, excuse me, 55 centimeter long guides. And inside that, we can use a four French JR catheter so that we can, when we um, use this combination of catheters, we can rotate only the internal catheter or we can rotate the external catheter. And with the combination of the two catheters rotating, we can obtain almost any angle we need inside the left atrium to point to the pulmonary veins. Of course, we can change the different curves catheters, but in general, a JR guide and a JR diagnostic catheter work very well together. 
So this is an example of now uh, a pulmonary vein atresia case that is being recanalized using radiofrequency. And as you can see here on the left panel, we have the tip of the Nikonen radiofrequency wire that crosses the lesion. Then um, what we do is um, advance the wire farther into the lung, but without radiofrequency. So we only use radiofrequency energy to advance a few millimeters across the occlusion. And then we try to advance the wire without energy to see if it passes. If it passes, that means it's already in the lumen and we advance it. And we hope to find that it takes the course, the trajectory of a pulmonary vein and does not get stuck in the lung parenchyma. But we wanna still confirm, is it actually in the vein or is it in the lung parenchyma? So we advance a microcatheter. This is called a protrac microcatheter. This advances over the radiofrequency Nikonen wire, and then we can remove the uh, Nikonen wire and inject. And when we inject, we can clearly see that we have successfully entered the pulmonary vein, and we're not just in the lung parenchyma. And now we can uh, advance a standard guide wire into that vein and use our guide catheter. Uh, after balloon angioplasty and stenting, you can see uh, that we have a nicely patent pulmonary vein. We tend to use drug eluting stents in pulmonary vein stenosis now almost exclusively when we're dealing with infants with small vessel diameter veins where a drug eluting stent is possible because we, in at least in the US, only have access to balloon expandable coronary type uh, drug, eluting, drug eluting stents. So, um, interventions, let's go back here. 85% of patients had a stent only with a median stent diameter of four millimeters and 15% had an angioplasty only. I would not generally advocate an angioplasty only, but it may be possible to have an extremely short segment uh, stenosis <clears throat> where we choose not to um, place a stent uh, and see if an angioplasty alone might work. Um, however, in the majority of cases, we expect restenosis to occur, so we um, would actually uh, advocate the placement of a stent um, immediately. Now, the types of stents we used, this changes over time as the types of stents change in the market. Uh, during the study, the majority of patients had a promus premier stent, that's 50%, 35% had a resolute onyx stent, and again, 15% angioplasty only. Now, we compared previously in another study uh, the use of drug eluting stents versus bare metal stents, and we found that there was a reduced rate of intimal proliferation within drug eluting stents uh, in pulmonary vein stenosis, and this drove uh, our adoption. Uh, this was another study we performed that was published in 2019, where um, when we started doing this, Initially, it was with the intent to only provide a drug diluting stent when other types of stents had failed. Um, however, um, with time, we saw that they were providing better results and we moved to solely using uh, drug diluting stents in infantile pulmonary vein stenosis. Uh, the same has been shown with uh, the ductus arteriosus, where we also have seen a reduced um, uh, intimal proliferation within drug diluting stents. There were three patients that had uh, complications related to pulmonary vein atresia recanalization, pulmonary hemorrhage in one, a pericardial effusion needing a pericardial drain placement in one, and an intimal injury to an adjacent pulmonary vein that resolved. So the pulmonary hemorrhage is probably the one that's worth talking about the most. It is certainly possible to injure the lung when we are trying to re-enter a completely occluded pulmonary vein. Um, it is uncommon to have hemorrhage if all we use is a CTO wire. The CTO wire will generally uh, find the true lumen, but on occasion when recanalizing the atretic pulmonary vein, it is possible for that CTO wire to become subintimal and to track along the wall of the pulmonary vein. It's important therefore to understand that if we've advanced a certain distance and we are feeling resistance in advancing the wire further, there are two options. One, we could be subintimal, or we could have taken a very early side branch and we could be lodged at the end of a side branch. In either case, we don't want to keep advancing. So we want to advance instead a tiny micro catheter over the wire, remove the wire, and take a small injection of contrast to see, are we in a patent vein or are we inside the wall of the vessel? If we are in the wall of the vessel, we may need to come back out and recanalize again. If we're in the terminal part of a small side branch, 
then we will see that it looks more like a wedge angiogram. And we, as we pull back the microcatheter, we see ourselves come into the patent pulmonary vein. Uh, in that case, we can use a standard guide wire, redirect ourselves to a better, more distal branch to uh, have the required support to then uh, advance a balloon catheter for angioplasty and for stent placement. Pulmonary hemorrhage has really been more a problem related to radiofrequency perforation across an atretic pulmonary vein. And for that reason, I think it is a technique that we could talk about entirely on a different day. It's a technique that deserves a lot of consideration for patients. And it is not something that I would advocate for people to try uh, without having carefully considered the, the, uh, the anatomy nearby, the bronchi, et cetera. And we've learned a lot about how to do this as safely as possible. It is a relatively risky procedure, but it can be done quite safely with the right um, uh, safeguards in place and uh, with some good success. So the time to the most recent cath was about um, half a year. So we do uh, follow up these patients with relatively frequent catheterizations. We know pulmonary vein stenosis is an aggressive disease that requires ongoing maintenance, that requires recatheterizations to keep redilating the stents. The same is true for pulmonary vein atresia, perhaps worse because it's a more potentially more aggressive disease. Among the 20 patients, uh, among 20 patients who had successful recanalization, 14 required additional transcatheter reinterventions. Three of those 14 that came back for reinterventions had atresia of the recanalized pulmonary vein, and one was successfully recanalized again. So the stents may occlude. We may have to come back and recanalize again. Generally speaking, recanalizing through a stent is easier. We see a target. We know exactly where to advance the wire, and it usually goes relatively easily, but it is something that we have to be prepared for, that we may have to come back and recanalize again. Some patients, of course, required multiple reinterventions. All of them, we expect, will require multiple reinterventions. It is simply related to the time frame of this study. Patients that were earlier in the study have had more reinterventions by the time we reported on this. Patients who had more recently undergone a recanalization had not yet had their reinterventions. So the range could be from one to eight procedures, but I have no doubt that this will turn out to be many procedures for all of these patients if uh, they uh, survive. And that our goal is to have them survive and have them come back and, and uh, maintain those veins patent uh, to keep them as healthy as possible. So for those who had a vein recanalized, on the left side, yes, the the number of patients that um, are alive at last follow-up, as you can see, 18 are alive and two died or required a heart transplant. Now, um, a heart transplant is not what we would do for pulmonary vein stenosis or atresia. So this was sort of death or transplant as a standard way of a uh, standard terminology. There were no patients who had a transplant for pulmonary vein stenosis. Um, on the right side, among patients who did not have a pulmonary vein recanalized. Uh, uh, 25 are alive and nine ha have not survived. Uh, and so as you can see, a 10% um, uh, death or transplant rate among those with successful recanalization, 26% death or transplant rate in those not recanalized. So we can perhaps see that uh, recanalization can be associated with uh, improved uh, survival. These are small numbers, so the uh, statistical, sig statistical significance was not achieved, but perhaps a trend towards improvement. The distal pulmonary vein diameter, what happens to those distal pulmonary veins? It's important to uh, understand uh, that we now have a new uh, paradigm shift in pulmonary vein stenosis. When I was training as a fellow, uh, you know, more than 20 years ago, the standard treatment uh, for pulmonary vein stenosis was generally nothing. And the reason is because we were told, and we all believed this, I did as well, that once a pulmonary vein is stenotic, that is the beginning of a disease that spreads into the lung. And once the veins are hypoplastic throughout that lobe, it means that the disease has spread into the lung. So there's no point in opening the ostium because the disease has spread severely throughout the lobe. I no longer believe this to be true, and I believe now we have enough data to tell us that that is actually not true. The disease does not spread that way. The veins become small because of disuse, lack of use, lack of flow through that lobe. And as soon as we restore patency of the ostium, we see that the distal veins actually grow. They're not diseased. They're just small because they had no flow. And as you can see at the index catheterization, at the time that we were recanalizing, the distal pulmonary vein had a mean diameter of 2.3 millimeters 
and look, the mean diameter was 3.6 millimeters with a highly statistically significant increase on the follow-up angiogram, which tells us that pulmonary veins do grow if you can stent the ostium. That is not true for every vein. As you can see, some had smaller diameters, but the majority do not have distal spread of the disease. That is a, a myth in the majority of patients. Most patients have osteal disease, and if you treat the ostium, the distal veins will grow. So in conclusion, recanalization of pulmonary vein atresia can be performed with a reasonable success rate and reasonably acceptable low complication rate. Not a zero complication rate, but the disease itself does not have a zero complication rate left untreated. So we have to balance that this can be a very severe disease for some patients, and the, therefore uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that some complications are possible, but we believe that overall the recanalization success rate is reasonable and uh, is worth uh, the, the potential risk of complications. We believe that there is a higher mortality for patients that are left untreated with pulmonary vein atresia, again, particularly if this involves both lungs and multiple lobes. Uh, the growth of the distal pulmonary vein has been a reassuring sign that we have seen repeatedly in many, many patients. That is now, in my mind, quite certain that most patients will develop growth of the distal pulmonary vein once we relieve the stenosis. So do not be uh, dissuaded from intervening when you see a patient with distal uh, pulmonary vein hypoplasia. Continued surveillance and frequent reinterventions will be needed in these patients. We know it's an aggressive disease and we have to match the aggressive disease with an aggressive intervention to, to fight back this disease. And that's why continued surveillance and frequent reinterventions will be needed. I want to thank all my colleagues at Texas Children's Hospital who made this study possible, who partnered with me uh, when I started this uh, program there for the development of uh, strategies, novel strategies to treat pulmonary vein stenosis. It was, uh, you know, something that was, uh, we were embarking into the unknown together and, uh, you know, having a supportive team that can back you up as we do these things all together is so important. So I'm really grateful for wonderful colleagues that I was able to partner with. Thank you so much. I will stop sharing and I'll be happy to take any questions. Amazing presentation and more than the presentation, amazing work. You guys are fantastic on that. And I need to say that I'm delighted to watch that. That's the way I was delighted to read the paper because I had this old concept. Exactly. For me, uh, pulmonary uh, vein atresia was a death sentence for, for the patient. A little bit different from your experience, the patients that I had myself, they all presented with pulmonary hypertension and sometimes are already with RV failure. I want to know about your experience with that. And if you face these uh, patients, how do they behave uh, uh, after the intervention? If you, after that, you treat them as a pulmonary hypertension, not a occlusive pulmonary hypertension anymore because they kind of change the pattern. So if you use uh, pulmonary vasodilators on these patients on the long run. And uh, another question, um, well, Answer this one first, and then I was, I was going to uh, ask about sirolimus if you use any medication, antiproliferative medication uh, after that. V very good, very good work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. These are all very, very good questions that we've all been grappling with. So I would say for the patients that have severe pulmonary hypertension, I've seen some patients dramatically improve with just opening the pulmonary veins. That baby that you saw that had five pulmonary vein stents uh, presented with pressures that were more than 150% of systemic RV pressure in RV failure, severe pulmonary edema. We thought we would end, end up having to put her on ECMO. She almost arrested just getting under anesthesia for the first procedure. But after five stents and after multiple catheterizations, the patient has normal pulmonary pressures, normal. They're, they're 20s over low teens. Um, and she's active, playful, she, she does sports. She's, she's a completely normal child in every other way. She has had now, I can't recall if it's 19 or 20 catheterizations. Uh, so this is, a, this is a recurring problem. We have to keep fighting it. And I will tell you, 19 or 20 catheterizations through the same right femoral vein with no femoral venous occlusion. So, you know, that is, that is possible. The femoral vein is completely healthy. And I will tell you that there's a few rules that I believe we have to establish for these patients. One important rule, no patient with pulmonary vein stenosis should ever have a central line in their femoral veins. That should be an, an absolute contraindication because 
the femoral veins are so important to these patients for allowing us to go back to do re-interventions. So at all costs, any central lines or, or peripherally inserted central lines, pick lines, should be in the upper extremities in these patients. And that is an absolute rule uh, that we should follow. Um, so sorry for diverting, but that's an important point I think that I just wanted to make. Regarding your other question about pulmonary vasodilator therapy, um, it is considered a relative contraindication to give patients pulmonary vasodilator therapies if they have pulmonary vein stenosis. However, when they have severe pulmonary hypertension, and we know this can be a reactive phenomenon to having had pulmonary vein stenosis, we have uh, gone ahead with pulmonary vasodilator therapy. We've had some patients on dual or even triple therapy and uh, with good success. Now, some patients, uh, we have to acknowledge, have disease that has not reversed itself. I follow a patient now that um, had been more than 10 years with pulmonary vein atresia, living on only two veins. And I recanalized the other three veins, one cath at a time, uh, getting through all three veins, recanalized all three veins, and her pulmonary uh, pressures have not changed at all. She's symptomatically better, so I, I think that was probably helpful to do. And I can't see how having an open vein is worse than a closed vein. So I think we probably are helping her in some way, but unfortunately she does not have any improvement despite triple therapy for pulmonary uh, hypertension. So uh, I think we should be aggressive with the disease with pharmacologic therapy as well uh, for pulmonary vascular disease. I, I can touch a little bit on anti-proliferative therapy that you discussed. Um, the uh, patients that we have been treating uh, with serolimus are, you know, not all the patients. It's the ones where we feel that we have severe multivessel disease and that we feel that we are not succeeding with a drug eluting stent alone. The rationale that we used to start serolimus um, was because we saw some patients that developed a wide open a pulmonary vein, after we place the drug eluting stent, they would have an open pulmonary vein, but some of them, not all of them, but some of them had disease developing more distally. Again, that's an uncommon, it's not a disease spreading in everyone, but some did have that. And those are the ones that we started on serolimus when we saw distal progression. Another group of patients that we started on serolimus are those that the stent itself was developing severe intimal proliferation. And that is another reason to help slow down the growth of intimal tissue within the stent. So those would be the two populations that we would use. Um, in general, it's not something I use as a first line therapy. I would go into the cath lab and achieve revascularization of the pulmonary veins. And I think it's also important to say that we in general do not take the old approach of going in and only doing one vein and, and then only doing another. I, I have done that, for example, in that recent case that had uh, three atretic veins because atresias do take a long time. They may take many hours to get through. But if, we can, if you can safely stent more veins at one procedure, try to achieve uh, immediate total revascular, re revascularization of the pulmonary veins if possible to make those patients rapidly better. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah. I'd like to introduce you, Dr. Hala. Dr. Hala is a fellow in uh, uh, Taormina now. We met in Libya. Good to see you, Hala. Very, very good to see you when we went on mission trip there, me and Sasha. And I think she has some questions for Dr. Justino, right, Hala? You're muted, dear. Unmute yourself. Hello, uh, how are you, Dr. Henry? Uh, Hello, Hannah. how are you? Fine, thank you. It's a nice presentation, and thank you for uh, for the presentation. And um, my question is: uh, you um, you presented the total cohort of the patient is a uh, fifty-four patient, right? So that's right. So because many patients, and I can go back to my uh, slides, because many patients and the initial cohort did not have any attempt at recanalization, uh, we included them only from the purpose of being able to uh, um, report on their mortality rate. But um, in reality, the ones that we discussed, technical uh, features of the recanalization uh, were uh, the 29 patients that had an attempt at recanalization. So what was the exclusion criteria for our uh, patient? So that's a very good point. This being a retrospective study, there were no uh, rigid inclusion or exclusion criteria. What we reported on is those who had a diagnosis of pulmonary vein atresia made in the cath lab or had a catheterization to confirm the diagnosis in the early era 
most people would not have intervened on those. We did not intervene on those either. And so those, it's not that to say that it, it wouldn't have been feasible today to re-intervene on them. It's just at that time in the early era, they did not receive an intervention. In the more recent era, there are some where we still don't intervene. And the rare ones that we don't intervene on might be, for example, patients who have a single low bar pulmonary vein atresia with no other vein involvement with normal pulmonary pressures. I will say that a patient like that is a little bit controversial. I have a conversation with the family and I'll say to them, okay, right now we've detected one vein that is atretic. The rest of the veins are normal. The pulmonary pressures are normal. If I'm dealing, this is how I, my decision-making in my mind. Um, you know, we, we all may have different approaches, but I would say this, if I see this, this is a young child, a two or three month old, I know that this is the time frame where pulmonary vein stenosis can progress. And I don't know that this is perhaps just the beginning of one vein being involved and other veins will continue to evolve. So I, I have to be frank with the parents and explain to them that I, if we don't treat this vein, that's fine, but we have to be very vigilant and looking at those other veins, because if they develop stenosis, and now it's no longer an isolated low bar phenomenon, it's now multi-vessel disease, and we have to consider being aggressive uh, for this disease if we want the child to survive. However, if I detect pulmonary vein atresia in a single lobe, and the child is five years old at the time we detect it, this is past the age at which de novo disease generally develops, and I feel comfortable saying to the family, this is likely not to start to involve other veins. And if you wish not to embark on multiple caths and treatments for the rest of your life for just one lobe, it is perfectly acceptable to leave that lobe alone and we will monitor for complications. And if we do develop serious complications like hemoptysis, et cetera, we can revisit that issue and possibly uh, provide intervention at that point. Does that uh, answer your question, Hella? Thank you. Uh, one one more but clarification. Uh, um, the, the when I um, looked at the paper in the in the website, they said that the cohort is sixty. So it's like changing something. Like yes. So in the final paper, we did have more uh, patients. That's correct. So at the time that this presentation was given, we had fifty four, but we continued to accrue a few more patients, and the final paper has the the final numbers. Correct. I apologize that I used slides that were from our presentation at a national meeting rather than the final uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I I Ari, con congratulations. It's again amazing experience, and of course we are learning a lot. I have a question as a surgeon. If I have a patient as a neonate uh, with uh, not two or three vein, uh, you know, involved in the disease, do you think that this, this disease is for intervention as first? Or we cannot, what, what is your idea to attempt for surgery? Because the, sur the results in this uh, small child, in this uh, population of patients, it's very bad and uh, mortality is very high. And at the same time, I think that uh, the, you have uh, good results for one to three months and you are not more able to adjust after. I think also interventional after surgery is, uh, can be difficult. So I would like to know your idea. If I have a child with three disease, three vein occluded, of course, uh, severe, moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension. As a first choice, what is your uh, idea? What is your suggestion? That's a great question, Sasha. And uh, here ha here's how I make my decision about that. I First of all, it's a collaborative decision. We have to do this decision in collaboration with our surgeon and with the family. So this is very important to make sure that we all have shared uh, decision-making in the process. I would say this, if the patient has congenital heart disease that will require open heart surgery anyway, in my mind, it's very clear to do surgery on the veins first, because that will give us a chance at potentially the sutureless repair um, having success and maybe not even needing further interventions. If they recur with stenosis, then I would definitely uh, suggest going to the cath lab and being aggressive with stenting. So that's the first category is patients who have uh, congenital heart disease that requires surgery anyway. For patients that do not have congenital heart disease that requires surgery, now we are talking about doing surgery only for the pulmonary veins versus a catheterization attempt. Then the discussion becomes much more around what is the likely success rate from a surgical repair versus a catheterization. 
I don't know what your experience has been, Sasha, but I, I, even from experience, uh, experienced surgeons who do a lot of pulmonary vein surgery, it seems that the restenosis rate is still quite high. And unfortunately, the, the, the literature does not have good long-term follow-up of suturless repair. We talk about it as a good technique, but unfortunately, there's very little data long-term on how those patients do. If the surgeon, in their own experience, thinks that there's maybe a 10 or 15 or 20% chance that the vein will be cured and will never need any interventions again, I think that we should offer that to the family. And because, because a catheterization is never a cure. We should be honest about that. It's lifelong interventions on those veins. So even a 20% chance of a cure on the vein, I would offer that chance to the family. But if my surgeon said, I think the chance of a cure is almost zero. I've always seen these come back. They don't work. Then I would not put the patient through open heart surgery. I would just go straight to the cath lab and start treating this in the cath lab. And many of the patients at Texas Children's, we ended up taking that approach because we did not, um, not, not for lack of skill or anything else. It's a, it's a, the, our, the surgeons are terrific. It's really, uh, strictly speaking, a disease entity that is so difficult to treat that it's difficult to justify putting the patient through an open heart surgery if we truly believe we're going into it with a nearly zero percent chance of a cure. Then there's no point. I would say. What What are your thoughts, Sasha? Yes, yes, I fully agree with you. The point is that, uh, as you said. Uh, if you have uh, isolated, it means without additional congenital heart defects, it's a very difficult uh, to decide what, which is the best. Of course, your experience give us you know, a, new, a new way. The, the, the choice is like, uh, it's better to go first and have in two, three months, a new case coming back because of uh, restenosis, or is better to fix a disease and let the pulmonary vein grow, understand and uh, recanalization therapy. This is the, I think that probably, as you say, you have to decide case by case, put on the table, what is the advantage on the risk on the other side by seeing every single child. The experience in neonates, I can tell you by the international literature. And as you say also, in long-term result, there is no one uh, procedure or surgical technique over another one in terms of uh, results and uh, freedom of reoperation. So we can say that uh, this is a real, uh, very difficult disease and uh, cumul cumul cumulative experience cannot permit to stratify which patient which will be better to another one. For sure, my feeling is that if I have, uh, I think in the other side, I go to the interventional. I like your approach because uh, I think that uh, the use of um, uh, corrected or, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, personalized stand case by case, depending on the, which disease uh, you have, can have a sense rather than to do balloon and wait and then see that there is a recoil of the vein. I think probably that fix the disease and make the, the pressure down in the pulmonary, in the right ventricular uh, side that can be really helpful for uh, the in child, uh, the neonates in the first uh, two, three months of life. This is my feeling. I don't think that uh, the actual uh, results on long-term and short-term with different uh, strategy or te technical strategy can say that this is uh, one lesion over another one. Of mm -hmm. course, osteal lesion of the pulmonary vein can have, uh, I think in surgery still uh, an option, but mm -hmm. osteal lesion. If mm -hmm. you have osteal lesion plus moderate to severe hypoplasia of the pulmonary veins, I don't really think super, that this uh, surgery can be superior to uh, interventional procedure. But this is, again, my feeling. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. This is my feeling. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Justino. Uh, quick, two quick questions, one ticking back. Uh, uh, you have a very nice slide of your experience of uh, how uh, interventionalists at one institution, they were not even ex uh, 
are trying to recanalize. Some of this is also related to uh, availability of equipment. But walk us through that experience of trying to make a team and how do other people can learn. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, interventionalists around the country, but they get a lot of pushback from their teams or surgeons and other cardiologists in their team that this disease does not have good outcomes. And this is probably one of the first papers in literature we'll see and hopefully help these patients. So tell us about that experience. And then also like we're using drug eluting stents from the coronary world in this population. So if you have an ideal stent in your mind from your experience, what do you think these patients would need? Would it still be a drug eluting stent or some other platform drug uh, reabsorbable stents or something else? Right. Uh, good questions, Varun. Thank you. You know, in terms of building a team, I do believe this is a team process. And what we ended up doing is involving closely the intensive care unit doctors, our cardiac surgeons, um, our general cardiologists who help manage the patient uh, when they're admitted to the hospital, um, the, pul the pulmonary hypertension team, I think I mentioned already. Uh, so these are all, and, and we actually initially, when we started using Serolimus, we actually work with our hematologists because uh, serolimus is commonly used for all sorts of vascular malformations. So we worked with a hematologist that specializes in vascular malformations and runs the ma vascular malformations clinic. Uh, and so this person was so accustomed to using serolimus that it was very natural for her to help us uh, with monitoring levels of drugs and all of those things. So we built a nice team around that. And I think that's really helpful. I will say, the, the, the team approach is very, very important. I will say there is a downside to a team approach, and I want to be careful in how I say this because team approach is always supposed to be good. Where, well, how can there be a downside to a team? The downside to a team is when the primary champion becomes less involved and, or, or disengaged. And this is very, very problematic. If you, for example, as an interventional cardiologist, do the procedures, but then expect someone else to follow the patient in the clinic, uh, and, and then they get lost to follow up, or they, they, the management might not be exactly what you think, uh, it's really better to stay involved. So team approach, but with someone who is a real passionate person, who is a champion behind all this, really staying closely involved with every patient. And I see all these patients in the clinic, and I make decisions with the family about when we should go back to the cath lab, et cetera. And uh, it, it's far better. And I find sometimes if I just um, don't have as much communication as I should with someone else and they're following the patient, the next thing I know, six months have gone by, the stent is occluded and I wish I had known before. So sometimes the team can get big and the communication can fail. So I think um, really staying closely involved, team approach, but with close involvement of the, the champion who is, who is trying to advance this. Um, in terms of uh, if I could dream of a, of a stent for the future, it, it would be some sort of biodegradable stent. The, the challenge that we face, I think, uh, which is different from in coronary disease or peripheral disease, where maybe biodegradable stents will, will take more of a role, is that when you're thinking about a lesion like a femoral artery or a coronary artery that has an occlusion in it, um, and we recanalize and place a stent, we can get apposition of the stent throughout the wall, throughout the length of the stent. In osteopulmonary vein disease, we will never have that. We will always have stent protruding into the left atrium because we have to bridge the stenosis with enough stent on either side of the lesion. And because it's an osteolesion, it, that implies automatically there will be stents protruding into the left atrium. So I have my concerns that biodegradable stents may never be the right answer for this because pieces of the stent that are floating in the left atrium and degrade could embolize. And of course, we're on the left side of the heart. So then we're worried about myocardial infarction, stroke, et cetera. So I would like to dream of a day when that's possible, but I'm being realistic and I'm not sure that it will ever be possible to have a biodegradable stent protruding by several millimeters into the left atrium. So uh, remaining realistic and remaining, um, you know, with the current landscape of what we have, it seems to be that drug eluting stents uh, work better than standard stents. I would say an important rule of thumb, use the shortest possible stent you can get away with avoid protruding too far into the lung where we start to get into bifurcations because you don't want to jail branches in the lung and you don't want to protrude too far into the left atrium either because then it makes re-entry into that stent very difficult. Um, so shortest stent possible, the vast majority of patients that I've treated with pulmonary vein stenosis, I use an eight millimeter long stent. That's the shortest stent in the US market. 
And that's important because then we avoid the problems of reentry and jailing of distal veins. So uh, try to avoid 12 millimeter, 15 millimeter stents because then you will regret having had stents that protrude very far in either direction. Uh, and then later on, coming back for stent fractures, as we redilate the stents past their natural geometric limit, we have to induce fractures. And we do that with very high pressure balloons like the uh, fiber reinforced balloons that we know are on the market. And those can induce cracks in the stents so that we can then place larger peripheral size stents and take those to adult size. For now, that seems to be the, the, uh, the tech tools that we have at our disposal. And I, I wish I could say that drug eluding uh, biodegradable stents will make a big difference in our field, but I, I, I'm concerned that this might not happen for our field because of the, the limitations of the anatomy of the osteo lesions. That's perfect. Thank you very much. It was an amazing meeting and... Uh... Can I just ask one more question? Yeah, the sure. last that I've been roaming around in my mind for a bit. Uh, Dr. Justino, uh, congratulations on, on your work. Uh, the only question that I have in my mind is, uh, you said this, these patients will require re-interventions, right? Uh, so is there any way to predict uh, how quickly a, a certain patient will require a re-intervention? Uh, uh, in other words, is there a subset of patients that you have seen which have required uh, re-interventions quickly or, or more quicker than the other patients? Yeah, that's a good question. It is very individualized. Some patients develop rapid restenosis and others don't. I, um, I am not a fan of doing repeat CAT scans to look at the pulmonary veins because that's a lot of radiation for these patients. And if you think of a lifelong risk of cancer that we can cause patients like this, it would be a tragedy for us to save them from pulmonary vein stenosis and then give them cancer, right? So we have to be very, very cautious. Um, so I limit the use of CAT scans to only at the time of diagnosis, perhaps, and uh, never again after that, almost never again do I use a CAT scan. And I do not use lung perfusion scans for the same reason, nuclear lung perfusion scans for the same reason, because they're, they're a form of radiation, ionizing radiation using nuclear material. So I use the echocardiogram to tell me when to go back. And really, I, if we can focus on every individual vein, uh, I'm not basing it solely on gradients because we know very well that uh, the pulmonary blood flow can redistribute to the healthy veins and we can have a vein that has severe stenosis without a very high gradient. So I'm looking at qualitatively what is the flow like through the stent? Is it laminar or is it turbulent? And can I detect what the vein looks like beyond the stent? And I have a patient coming to the cat lab in a week where I placed a stent recently and uh, I made the stent about as big as the healthy pulmonary vein in the lung. And now I can clearly see that in the lung, the vein is like this and then the stent is this big, you know? And um, I know that the vein has grown distally and it's time to augment the stent. The other thing I look at is on 2D, I look at the stent diameter edge to edge of the metal stent, which we can usually quite well see by echo. And then I look at the width of the color jet through the stent. So if I see that the stent is a four millimeter stent and the color jet through the stent is a one millimeter jet, whether it's turbulent or not, this is a stent that has a lot of intimal proliferation. It's time to go back and open that stent again. And then I liberally go back to the cat lab. I don't need a confirmatory test like a CT scan to tell me that because then more radiation and then I'm gonna come back to the cat lab anyway. What is it gonna gain me? So again, I limit the use of that. I would also say there's lots of things we can talk about and I'm happy to have other uh, webinars like this where we can discuss other strategies, but radiation reduction strategies in the cat lab are incredibly important. So we use, for example, a pulse fluoro rate on fluoroscopy of 2.5 pulses per second. Um, on cine angiography, I use four or five frames per second, not 7.5 or 15 or more frames per second of cine angiography, because that's a huge amount of radiation. So we can, with very simple strategies, reduce the radiation burden to these patients by a factor of 75 or 80% simply by adjusting how we use our fluoroscopy equipment. So Lots of things like this that we can do, but in essence, the goal is reduce radiation exposure and use as much as possible the echocardiogram to guide when is the time to go back to the cat lab. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have one question for the audience. If you have any of these patients with renal failure. That's a very good question. Um, 
I do not have any pulmonary vein stenosis patients that have advanced renal failure. Um, there may have been people who presented in shock and had, you know, transient, um, like acute tubular necrosis or transient renal dysfunction, but I do not, in my recollection, uh, let me know if anyone else on the panel has encountered this problem. I'd be curious to know uh, what is the relationship for this patient to have both renal failure and pulmonary vein stenosis. That is a that is an unusual combination. I would be intrigued to learn more about that patient. Yeah, I, I understand it. Maybe he uh, was talking about the complications and the possible uh, problems about radiation. He just uh, thought about the, the contrast usage on on the on the kidney performance of this patient. Thank you. That's what I well, understand. So from from that angle, I will say that I have not seen patients develop renal failure mm -hmm. after contrast use. Uh, it is a, a, a factor of using small amounts of contrast each time hand injections uh, directly into the pulmonary veins and really doing this with a very, very acceptable amount of contrast. We're usually, you know, three to five cc's per kilogram of contrast uh, uh, per per case. And, uh, you know, we're not, if, if the patient has renal failure, you could limit that and then come back to the cath lab another time for additional work instead. But yes, I, that's an excellent question. I have not seen patients develop renal failure from these procedures. Okay, perfect. Plus, I think very, another question may have come up. Uh, as I could see, you no, know, he's just uh, said that yes, he was talking about complication. Perfect. So thank you very much. It was an amazing session, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to benefit from uh, your work and and uh, and the, the YouTube uh, because you're going to be able to spread uh, this uh, webinar to our colleagues and uh, for sure for us to review as well and. Um, Thank you very much. I hope, uh, thank you very much for watching today, guys. And, um, and it was great. I, I, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Varun. Thank you so much. Yes. We wait to you in Sicily. I, I look forward to it. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.